Greetings everyone. Welcome to the 131st session of the online Optum learning series, OLS. And once again, uh, we have with us today, Dr. Andrew Parker. He has been with online Optum learning series for a previous session where he talked about, uh, you know, dry eyes and its management. And uh, today, Dr. Parker is going to talk to us about vignettes in myopia management. Just to give you all a brief about Dr. Parker, he earned his OD, MS, and PhD degrees from the Ohio State University. And he's currently an assistant professor and also the chief of the myopia control clinic at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Dr. Parker has been the principal investigator of a National Eye Institute funded project which relates to myopia development and he is currently doing a lot of other projects which are related to refractive error, dry eyes and contact lenses. He is a contributing editor for the contact lens spectrum. He, he has been awarded with a couple of fellowships. He is a fellow and diplomat of the American Academy of Optometry. He is also a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. And very recently, he's also been awarded by the British Contact Lens Association when he successfully, uh, you know, completed and achieved his fellowship award. Uh, he has received numerous awards to his honor. He was also awarded uh, the Optometry Rising Star by the Associations of Schools and Colleges of Optometry. And with that experience, uh, Dr. Pucker is going to talk to us some tips and, uh, you know, he's going to take us through some cases uh, whereby myopia management and how should we go about, you know, choosing that particular option. So, uh, welcome once again, Dr. Pucker, onto our platform. Uh, I do understand it's a very late evening, uh, you know, thank you for staying up and, uh, you know, doing the session for us. I'm happy to be here, and I'd like to thank the OOLS for inviting me back. It is late here, but I'm a night owl, so this is perfect for me. All right, um, today I'm going to be presenting three cases that I um, managed while in the myopia control clinic at UAB Eye Care. Before that, though, I'm actually going to give you a little background. I know there's a variety of experience levels in this audience, so I'm going to give you a brief background. I can't go as in-depth as I'd like just because of time, but I hopefully will give you the tips you need. And if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll try to monitor that the best I can, or you can even shout out. But for sure, at the end, I'm happy to stay as long as you'd like for questions. So why should we be incorporating myopia control into our clinics? Well, one, we know that the prevalence of myopia throughout the world is dramatically increasing. There's probably more than two and a half billion myopes in the world with a B. And by the time uh, 20, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 rolls around, we'll be probably having half of the world or about 5 billion of the uh, world's population being myopic. Myopia is more than just a nuisance. It's more than just blur at distance. It's also a risk factor for other vision threatening conditions such as cataracts, glaucoma, retinal attachments. And the main reason for that is because a myopic eye just tends to grow longer and longer. You don't get more eye, you just get a thinner and thinner eye and it predisposes you to those conditions I mentioned. There's a fair amount of scientific data suggesting that myopia control methods work. I'm going to present some of that before I go into my cases just so you have some key studies under your belt um, that hopefully you can use in your patient care. And then finally, I think that myopia management is becoming standard of care around the world. And hopefully uh, after going through my lecture today, you'll agree with me. So this is the menu that we offer in the UAB Eye Care Myopia Control Clinic. We offer atropine, soft contact lenses, different types of soft contact lenses, and we also offer orthokeratology. So what I'm going to do is go through some key aspects of all three of these before we jump into our patient care. Several years ago now, atropine was kind of almost found by accident, at least low-dose atropine was found by accident for treating myopia management. In a seminal study from Chia, they were using 1% to slow myopic growth 
with. And we have known that's been effective for several years. But there's lots and lots of side effects that go with it, such as photophobia and a decreased ability to see up close. But this study wanted to see what you know concentration was most effective. And also, if you could go lower, you know, how low could you go to still get a meaningful effect? And the group actually used 0.01% as a kind of no treatment control. And just by chance, it turned out to be the most effective long-term. So if we look at the Adam study from Chia on the left here, the purple boxes or triangles, I should say, are the 1%. And we can see that is by far the most effective at slowing eye growth. The red line here is the control, so no treatment at all. And the green is the 0.01%. But when we get to this two-year line here, the lines kind of switch. So they actually the 0.01% became the most effective compared to all the other concentrations, which surprised everyone. This original study, though, mostly had an effect on refractive error, not so much, at least with 0.01% on axial length. So a more recent study from, from YAM, uh, the LAMP study, found that if you use 0.025% or 0.05%, it's superior compared to 0.01%. And also, you know, there's still not a lot of side effects and it slows both axial length and refractive error. So we pretty regularly offer atropine in our clinic. We, in um, roughly last July, got the myocyte contact lens. It's a daily disposable contact lens. It's actually the only FDA approved product in the United States specifically for slowing eye growth, at least that we can get. There has recently been a ortho K system that's been FDA approved, but we can't get that here in the United States yet. My site is specifically indicated by our FDA for slowing eye growth in kids eight to 12 years old, and it's available up to minus six diopters, and it has a universal plus two add. The, uh, the MySight clinical trial was very effective over a three-year time period. If we're looking at refractive error here on the left, they found an additive effect that resulted in a 59% slowing in refractive error over three years. And that also showed up with axial length. It was about 52% slowing over three years. And really that's kind of our goal is to try to slow eye growth by at least 50%. And I'll have some data showing maybe that's as much as we can actually do in clinics soon to be uh, described more later. I've been using the NatureView for a long time, probably five years now. You know, it's not specifically indicated for slowing eye growth, but it has a wide range of refractive errors. It goes up to minus 1225. So this can even work for a higher myopes. It has an extended depth of focus design, design. And the company says that it's roughly a plus three ad in the periphery. And Doug Benoit, one of my friends who works for VTI thinks it's even more than that. And uh, my lab in particular, Kara Sabla is going to do a power profile on this lens soon. So hopefully we get a definitive answer on what the ad is. This here is a, a study by Cooper on the, on the NatureView lens. It's not a randomized trial like my site, but it has promising data indicating that during this case study, 81.25% of patients had complete halting of eye growth. So, you know, I feel like there's decent data there. We need better randomized studies to vet this, but I feel comfortable offering them in my clinic. We likewise offer the Biofinity. This is probably been used the longest in myopia management. It's got a wide range of powers. It goes up to, to at least minus 10. And it has a variety of ad powers, plus one, plus 152, and 250. And in general, we want to use the center distance design, this one, because we want to correct the vision at the fovea and reduce the peripheral hyperoptic focus in the periphery of the retina, which is what we think is giving us the meaningful effect and slowing of eye growth. And this is how all of the contact lenses work that I'm going to talk about today. The Blink study was recently published in JAMA in, I think, August of 2020. Yes, August, so not that long ago. And this study was important for a couple of reasons. I don't have time to go through all of this study, but in, in essence, this study enrolled single vision contact lens wearers, so regular biofinities. Then they had people also 
also randomized to a plus 150 ad and a plus 250 ad. And what the study overall found was that there's a significant reduction in both refractive error and axial length in the children who were fit in the 250 ad compared to single vision. When you compare single vision to the plus 150 ad, there actually was no difference, suggesting that whenever we are prescribing myopia management, we want to prescribe at least a plus two because we know the MySight works. That's a plus two ad. And then the Blink study found that a 250 works. So in my clinic, we always offer at least a plus two ad because of those two studies um, in aggregate. For a long time, we had trouble fitting our patients in astigmatism in a myopia management device. Recently, as of really last summer, um, CooperVision gave extended parameters for their uh, biofinity lens. So we can now fit pretty much any person with astigmatism in this lens. But uh, historically in my clinic, I've been using the Pro IntelliWay Pro. It's a custom soft lens. It has, you know, up to minus 20 with 12 doctors of sill. So if you have an extreme patient who can't even be fit in the, the biofinity in the newest version, we could still come back to the IntelliWave. There's no specific data supporting this other than all the other contact lens studies that are you know, showing essentially that this design should work, but there's no specific IntelliWave study out there yet. And then finally, our last uh, contact lens option is orthokeratology. Here's the two systems I use in my clinic. There's several more around the world, but in the United States, Paragon CRT was the first, and it's probably the most commonly used here. From what I understand is the uh, Euclid system or the Emerald lens is more commonly fit in Asian countries. And maybe in the chat, you can shout out if you, you know, use one or the other or some other system just to, you know, so I know the market better. There's a couple of studies suggesting, actually there's several studies, but these are the two early studies suggesting that orthokeratology works. We have um, the first one from Pauline Cho is orthokeratology or spectacles. They found at two years, it was a 54% reduction in axial length. This was not a randomized study. It was just two groups of subjects. So not you know, the best design, but it was the first study and it's just a huge momentous thing in this you know, 2005 study. Later um, in 2009, Jeff Walling published his randomized trial on this topic. And he, again, he, he found 55% slowing in axial length. So this and several of the studies since, since suggest that orthokeratology is a good go-to for slowing eye growth. One thing to note is that if you're fitting a person in orthokeratology, you really can't use refractive error as a benchmark because you're essentially neutralizing refractive error with the lens. So you kind of have to use axial length or just, you know, lens changes potentially to know if you're getting a good effect or not. When patients come into my clinic and their families really come into my clinic, it's more of a family type of thing. They often ask, what is best for my patient? And really, assuming they fit the different parameters that are required for each option for contact lens, it, it really depends on their lifestyle. And, you know, with the keratology, if you have someone who's active in sports, who's swimming, you know, you could have that patient wear the keratology by the sleep. And they won't need to wear anything in the water. So they're safer maybe with orthokeratology if they're a swimmer or they're in dirty environments. Atropy may be better for young kids because they're not ready for contact lenses yet. I mean, there's a lots of things you can consider and unfortunately I don't have time to go through all of them, but really in my mind, they're all about the same efficacy. It's more about what will work best for that, that patient's lifestyle. So this brings us to our first case. I saw this patient starting in last summer, so July 22nd in 2020. Uh, this patient is 11-year-old white male at the time of reporting to clinic, and he was specifically referred to my clinic for myopia management. The father indicated that his son sees well with glasses, really no past history of eye issues to worry about, comfortable, you know, kind of your ideal young kid for contact lenses. We did our workup, and I'm going to give you kind of the highlights of that. The, the patient's entering visual acuity was 2020. Anterior segment health was normal. Binocular vision and fields were normal. Binocular vision is important in myopia management because if we give them a 
a multifocal contact lens that may change their you know, ability to fuse. So we always monitor those so, sort of things along with eye health because you know this is a contact lens and that could change your eye's health. Key points from this patient's workup is that he's a fairly low myope. He's 225 with some sill in the right eye and 250 with some sill on the left. He could see very well with that refraction. His axial length was a little under 24, maybe, you know, middle 23s. Just for your reference, the average adult eye is 24 and a half. And I didn't say this in my introduction, high myopia is considered to be a 26 millimeter or longer eye. So that can give you a little reference. So this person's still young and growing, but he hasn't reached, you know, a long, long eye yet, which is good. And then pretty average keratometry values. So here are the options I presented to you. I don't have time to go through all of the different parameters, but I'm going to tell you that this patient could fit all of the different options that I mentioned. Refractive error is pretty minimal. His age is 11, so he could probably learn how to work contact lenses well. Um, you could go with a custom soft lens. He probably doesn't need it, but you know these are all options that I think through. What we ended up doing was that um, you know, good patient education and discussion, we go through a long consent form and the patient gets to decide and the family gets to decide before we go forward. We just present everything to them and, and, and the family decided to go forward with a MySight contact lens. So this is our daily disposable lens. We picked out powers that somewhat mimicked the refractive error. We had to compensate for the cylinder. Remember, it's a standard plus two add. We put the lens on, we did over refraction. There was no over refraction. So it was 2020 with this power, no over refraction. We just said it was good. Um, and you know, when we evaluated, it was good coverage, saturation, and movement. So the contact lenses look good. And overall, on that day, what we did after getting our information, fitting the contact lenses, we talked about all the things we talked about in summary. We educated the family that, you know, my site's good and they elected to go for that. We taught the patient how to wear the contact lenses. He was able to put them on somewhat. Okay. He was a little shaky. Dad helped some. Um, and then we, you know, gave him some solution. And I do this with all of my daily disposable lens wearers. I think it's important to give them some solutions, especially when they're starting out because they're going to have handling issues and they may drop it, right? You don't want them to throw away a whole bunch of expensive contact lenses while they're learning. So having a care system on hand, even for daily disposables, I think is important. The patient returned you know, a few days later. We did a regular contact lens evaluation. We did our history and we found that the patient had good comfort and vision in the current contact lenses. He was still having a little trouble with applying the lens in the morning, but the father was helping and really they had a system that worked for them and I was okay with that. In general, I prefer my, my kids to be able to wear the contact lenses on their own, especially if they're soft lens wearers, but if you know they do the right things, I, I'm probably okay with it. We evaluated the contact lens like you would at any contact lens follow-up. The lens uh, this time is giving 2015 vision, and maybe the patient adapted a little bit. When, whenever you have a multifocal contact lens, your brain has to learn how to use it. So they're splitting an image for far away and up close, and you know, you generally get a little better acuity on the follow-up visit, not always, but sometimes. So the patient's seeing great, the contact lenses fit well. We educated the family that this contact lens is doing an amazing job, it fits well, and that, you know, I think we're okay to finalize this prescription. So what we did is we finalized it. We went to the Brilliant Futures program. You have to be invited to be in this program. And we uh, put their the patient's information into the program and they purchased a 12 month supply, which is shipped to them quarterly through the mail. And we uh, asked our patient to return for a my myopia management follow up at six months. I do that with all my my myopia management patients. I want to make sure that they're using their contact lenses properly because they're typically children. So that's a compliance check. We also can get additional data 
to make sure that things are going well. But generally, I don't make a change in treatment until one year because there's seasonal variations in eye growth and that sort of thing. The patient came back for roughly six months. It was actually a little bit longer than that. With COVID, things got you know kind of crazy here, just like everywhere else. So the patient was a little late to the six-month follow-up. But when they came in, he was wearing the contact lenses, and they were fitting well, reported good compliance, comfort, and vision. The father was still helping with contact lenses a little bit. On the weekend, the son would apply the contact lenses on, the, on his own so he could do it. Just time-wise, the father did it in the morning to get him off to school on time. At this visit, we did our standard myopia management workup. So we got refractive error that was roughly the same as the last time. Acuity was great with refraction and axial length was pretty similar. We evaluated the contact lens, still 2015 vision, good coverage, centration, and movement. If you ever get something like that, just leave it as is. Don't try to break them. So we have some data and I'll, I'll show you it in aggregate on a couple of slides from here. But this is some data from the Johnson & Johnson myopia guidelines that I helped put together um, a few months ago. It's actually some data from the collaborative, collaborative evaluation of longitudinal evaluation of refractive error study, which my PhD advisor, Don Muti and Carla Zadnick ran. But they ran this data and they found that at age seven, the typical kid who is Asian has a 0.5 millimeter growth in axial length if they're myopic. And refractive error was minus one worse or progressed, you know, in that year. Non-Asian or white, this really should say non-Asian, progressed less, but they still progressed a lot. And this progression happens fastest when you're younger, so at age seven. And by the time you get to age 12, you're still probably progressing more than an emetrope, but you're not progressing as much. So maybe half as much as when you're at age seven. So the younger you are, the worse your myopia is probably going to be. Just for reference, the typical emetrope, non-myope really, progresses roughly 0.1 millimeters per year. So some eye growth is expected, but this is probably 0.4 more. We said several slides back that the MySlight lens slows eye growth by about 50%. And I said, you know, I was going to talk about this again. And here is that data. So Mark Bullermore and Paul Chamberman, so several of the people involved in developing the MySlight lens did a modeling study. This was just published and we presented this in a journal club at UAB. What they found is what they look at the RINDA study. So this was done in RINDA, California, and then the SCORM study, which was done in Singapore. If they just follow myopes for three years, this is how much they progress. And these subjects were kind of modeled after the subjects that were in the MySight study. So this was the progression of your typical myope in these two large longitudinal studies. And the control group in the MySight study was basically the same as the myopes were just progressing in these two big studies. Whereas the emetropes were progressing about 0.1, like I said, per year. And if you compare that to the kids treated with the MySight contact lens, their axial length was actually about the same as the kids who were just emetropic. So this at least suggests that you may not be able to get more than 50% slowing in axial length if you're using a contact lens device. So if we look at our data and side by side from visit one, the baseline to the six month visit, we see that for both the right eye and the left eye, the refractive error is virtually the same. Axial length is virtually the same. So there is no progression. So we can do this for visits after visits after visits. I don't have time to do that today, but we could just keep looking at all these different, you know, visits and say, you know, is there progression or not? Sometimes you might debate it, but for sure in this case, there is no progression. So what we educated the family on was that they're, the child is doing great. Just keep up what you're doing. You know, take care of your contact lenses. There's no progression. So we don't need to make any changes to the glasses or contact lens prescription. And we want to see you back in six months. 
So um, I'll see that six month visit probably you know, August, September. And I don't have your data on these patients yet, just because of the timing, you know, of the, the pandemic and the ability to get the mycite contacts. So let's jump to patient two. Our second patient is an eight year old female patient. She was referred to UAV Eye Cares. Um, from UBA, UAB Eye Care's pediatric department. And I knew that the mother was a physician. So a very educated family. The mother was interested in reading the consent and actually some of the references we reference in it. The patient was an established atropine patient. I didn't say this before, but if you have atropine and put someone also in contact lenses, there's a bonus. So they get more treatment if they're on both. So they were in our clinic specifically to um, potentially do contact lenses. So what we did was our, our basic workup. We found that the patient had 20, 20, um, they shouldn't say contact lenses with glasses of, uh, acuity was 2015 in both eyes. There was normal binocular vision and fields, normal anterior segment exam. This is our baseline information. This patient was minus five. So fairly high myo for being young though could see well still axial length was approaching that of an adult or maybe a little more, even though she's still very young. And then we took K's and that was normal. So here are some topographies, very normal. Um, corneas, no major astigmatism to worry about. Let's look at our options. So here are our options. We talked about these before, and this patient's actually an option for all of these. Um, kind of borderline for orthokeratology, but still could fit in that. So we have a family come in and they, they essentially demanded orthokeratology. And I get a little worried when my patients are minus five, they typically are a little bit longer fits. It takes me maybe a remake or two, whereas a patient who's minus one or two is usually a slam dunk, but they were really motivated. They said they were okay with that. We ordered an empirical lens from Euclid. So we got the Emerald lens and then we had them back for dispense visit. We put the lenses on. We found that it was a bullseye pattern. I'll show you a video of that coming up, but the lenses looked really nice on the eye. This is a very standard fit or design from Euclid. So you can go a little bit plus because at the end of the day, you, um, you're reshaping the cornea and the treatment regresses over the day. So you overcorrect in the morning so that they're okay by the end of the day. We um, taught the patient how to use the lenses. She was great at applying and removing them. Here is the lens on the eye. So you can see me scanning around. This is taken with the eye photodoc, a camera system we have at UAB. At the um, visit three, we found that the patient was still myopic, and this is normal. You start off about minus five, and in my clinic, I've seen that you typically get one or two diopters of correction, or roughly 50%. So the patient, you know, went down from minus five to roughly minus three, could see well when we did the refraction, and this you know, of course, is going to make it so the patient can't use their glasses during the day. And we don't want them to wear the contact lenses during the day because they're somewhat uncomfortable, at least initially. So what we do in our clinic is we offer our patients Acuvioasis or just some daily disposable to make up the difference. Not all patients opt to have this daily disposable lens while they're adapting to lenses over the first week or two. But if you have a patient with heavy divisional demands, uh, they, they often go for it. The one night, so the topography after wearing the lenses for one night look like this. You can start to see some treatments centrally. You're not going to have a big bullseye pattern initially. And the really the first morning visit is you, you never make a change, but you want to get some data to see how you're doing. But it's nice to see that there is a flattening centrally, starting to see the bullseye happen in both the right eye. So it's flatter centrally in both eyes. And then you're starting to get some steepening in the mid periphery in both eyes. And that is what slows refractive error. At least that's what we think it does. We had the patient back at one week. Uh, this probably should be visit four, but we found that there was still some refraction. So the patient was minus two with some sill and minus 
150 with some sill on the left eye. Whenever you have some induced cylinder with orthokeratology, you need to start thinking that the lens is a little discentered. So you go to your topography and kind of troubleshoot. You may consult with your, your lab, but what we ended up doing after consulting with the lab and looking at the topography was ordering a toric lens. And a toric orthokeratology lens is intended to help with centration. It doesn't correct astigmatism. What it does is it better fits the corneal shape and it better centers the lens. So that's what we did. We let the patient try the lens out for like another week or so. At dispense, the lens allowed 20-20 vision. A week later, the patient comes back. The right eye is perfect. You wanted a little plus. Could see 2020 without any glasses or contact lenses on after wearing the lens for you know roughly a week. But we still had some some induced cylinders. So this person probably still has a decentered lens. And if we look at topography on the right eye, you see a nice bullseye pattern. It's flat centrally. If we're looking at the tangential maps, which are actually the same maps, the bottom two here. But on the left eye, you can see the lens is just centering out. So that is where that induced cylinder is coming from. So we've already changed the lens to its toric. So the next thing you would do to make it stable and centered is probably make it bigger. Bigger lenses stabilize and center better. A clinically meaningful change in orthokeratology is this 0.2 millimeters bigger. So that's what we did. We dispensed the lenses. Patient came back, had no complaints, was close to plano or emetropia. After, you know, wearing the lenses all day, this was a midday visit and the patient was happy. So we called it good enough. And we've been following this patient for, you know, several actually years now. Well, you're almost two years now. And this patient's been doing really well, no major progression. I don't have time to go through all of those visits, but that's how you would fit an orthokeratology lens for myopia management. My final patient, patient today is a 12-year-old Asian female. She reported a myopia control clinic for consultation. The family indicated that they're interested really in the least invasive option possible. And this is really you come to your consent. You talk to your patient about all the options as you go through things and kind of push them to the thing that you think is best for them. But we'll come back to that. The patient noted that she saw a clear distance with one-year-old glasses, so probably not progressing a ton, but still they're worried. They want um, to, the question's coming in. I'll come back to those soon. Um, you still, they still wanted to do an option. The patient had no weird binocular vision or contact lens, or sorry, no corneal issues that would prevent a con prohibit a contact lens. And the patient was currently in the sixth grade. So this patient was fairly, you know, with it, very responsive, able to do everything we wanted to. Um, there was no significant ocular family history, normal you know, slit lamp and stuff. And when we did our baseline workup, we found that the patient was roughly minus three um, in both eyes, relatively normal axial length, still roughly 24 and a half in normal case. So these are our options again. And again, this patient is a candidate for all of these. And the patient actually ended up going with the biofinity partly because of cost and timing. We didn't have the my site at this time, but the my, uh, the biofinity is a, a great lens and the patient wanted to go with that for, you know, kind of the reasons I mentioned, put the lens on, we want the 250 ad, we try to go with the highest one that they can accept. And it looked good on the eye. So the patient and mother were educated extensively about the options. They ended up going up with the biofinity. We taught the patient how to use the lenses, was able to complete the training, and we gave, again, some BioTrue for a solution. Uh, we wanted the patient to come back in about two weeks, and this is what we, we dispensed. So in two weeks, the patient came back for the follow-up visit. The patient reported good comfort and vision in the current contact lenses. She noticed a little blur, but you got to really ask kids what blurry is. Sometimes they'll say, I, I was blurry for like 10 seconds on Tuesday and that's it. So you really got to dive down and do some testing to see how they're doing. What we did is our contact lens eval. Contact lenses looked amazing. The patient could see roughly 20-20. I'm okay with 20-25 in myopia management. And in general, we just said it was good enough. So we educated the patient that this is what we were going to go with. We educated them to buy a six-month supply because we thought that you know they should be good for then, and we wanted to come back in six months. So this is what we finalized. 
In six months, the patient came back relatively on time. We did our refraction, axial length, you know, our basic workup that you would do. And really the patient was happy, but we didn't, you know, all the tests that we are supposed to in our, our clinic were very thorough. The lenses look good. Maybe there's not perfect acuity in that lens, but when we compared to the previous visits, so visit one and visit two for baseline and six months for both the right and left eye, there virtually was no progression, maybe a quarter or so, but that could be very day-to-day -day variation. And really, again, I was not inclined to switch it because there really was no over refraction with the contacts. So we educated the family that this is, you know, probably the best thing for them and that we want to see them back in six months. And we, you know, do the same workup and comparison at that visit. So overall, I think that the consensus is that these options are safe for our patients. They should be prescribed because if you're myopic and you're under 12 or 13, you're almost for sure going to be progressing. You don't need to wait for progression over a year. You can just assume they're going to progress and treat them. And in that way, you'll probably be doing the best for your patients. We need to choose the most appropriate option. So first we have to make sure that the patient's a candidate based upon refractive error and that sort of thing. And then after that, we just pick what's best for their lifestyle. We need to set realistic expectations for both the patients and the parents. As I said early on, we're gonna expect some axial length progression. We're gonna expect a little bit of refractive error progression. We're just trying to prevent it from going crazy. So we don't want our patients to think it's gonna be dead halted like these cases. We had more time, I'll give you, a, you know, one that went off the rails, but we need to make sure everyone's on board and that they're not surprised when there is a little change overall and, you know, from visit to visit. And then, of course, there's a lot more studies happening. And with that, we'll just be able to better treat our patients. So with that, I will take questions. I think uh, for that wonderful uh, talk and, you know, taking us through the experience of three different cases and it's really important uh, to understand, I think case base is something also we must uh, know on how things are happening. All right. So the first question here is, uh, what's your opinion about discussing myopia management options, uh, you know, to the patient? Would you do it straight away or would you do it after the trial? Is there anything which, uh, you know, you would like to uh, comment on this? In my clinic, it's a referral clinic. So if they come to me, we for sure talk about all the myopia management options. If you're in primary care, I would still bring it up. Yeah. You know, most of your patients are going to be myopic because they're going to the optometrist. Generally, you know, they're coming to get glasses or getting an eye health check. But if they are potentially progressing, I would certainly at least bring it up. If you're not comfortable with offering myopia management, you can refer to a colleague in town, but I think this is something that you could all really reasonably do with the many different products we have out there these days. That's right. Okay. So, so explaining to the patient always uh, is, is the first thing before you, you know, possibly want to start any trial, if, if I may put it that way. Yeah. So the second part of the question was, how do we document the compliance of uh, wearing these lenses? Is there any way or specific way, uh, you know, you would document that? If you were running a myopia trial, you would have them do surveys intermittently. I think the Blink study does it like every six months or something. Don't quote me on that, but that's how they do it. We mostly just interview them at every six month visit. We ask them how they're doing. We do the teach back method. So we ask, what are you doing? How are you doing it? And if they're not doing it quite right, we re-educate them. We just document that the best we can. If you were savvy at practice management, maybe you would send them texts or give them a call from your office, maybe in the interim at three months and nine months. But we don't honestly have the capabilities to do that in a, a clinic like ours. There's, well, I, know, I know you all have huge clinics there, but at a school, we have a lot of people and there's something like 20 or 25,000 patients a year we have come through our clinic. So it's hard to, to get all that data. That's right. Yeah. And I think as, as you said uh, correctly, I think when you're interviewing your patients during your aftercare or your follow-up visits, that would, if you do that nicely and correctly by knowing what they are doing and all, all of the information, I think that should be sufficient enough
for us to know at least the compliance and relating it to the changes as well. So if you see that there is not much of changes or the refractive error is progressing very fast, uh, probably it's it, you can say that it's a non-compliant, maybe. It could be related to compliance. Um, yeah. I didn't talk about a, a person progressing too much. In that instance, I would probably do a dual therapy. So say they're on contact lenses alone, I would probably add atropine. And that's about all we can do. You're probably getting some benefit. And maybe that patient was intended to grow two diopters that year and they only grow one. So one might seem like a lot, but maybe that patient's pre-programmed growth was going to be a lot more than that. So it's really hard to, to know where they're going to go. So you, you try to be as cautious as you can. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much for that tip. Uh, the next question is any specific strategies in terms of myopia management uh, would you, uh, you know, consider if you have high myops? and especially children who are young. So anything different you would do from the normal patient? Probably the main thing different I would do is just, am I stable now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. It's just that okay. it's a bit shaky, but you can hear you well. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, the main thing I would say to the, the family is that these products have not been tested specifically in high myopes. The trials typically include patients who are minus four or better, minus five or better, maybe minus six or better. But when you're getting to the minus six to 10, they're generally not included in the trials. So I would suggest that, you know, this should still work. It's a little less vetted in the research, but doing something is better than nothing. You know, if they're they're minus six, seven at say age 10, they're probably going to keep going and maybe they'll reach 10 or 12. So I would recommend doing an option. In this case, you'd probably be limited more to the Biofinity or NatriView, or I'm not sure all the specific products you have in your different countries, but something that is for, you know, that has a center distance multifocal that can go in the higher minus powers. All right. Great. Yeah. That's, I mean, at least you can do something than nothing. And we know that evidence shows, I mean, you talked about a lot of evidence in terms of research papers. Of course, they are not for high myopes, but we know that these works for low myopes. There's no harm in, you know, trying them out, right? Exactly. And it probably, I, I, I'm very confident it does, but as a researcher, I know why they don't do it. They're going to have less of a treatment effect probably in the higher higher myopes. So that's why they're excluding them from the trials. That's right. Yeah. And uh, the other question is, this is more of a spectacle lenses. I know this is, this was, we were talking about contact lenses and atropine today, but uh, how about uh, your experience if you have on using the Essilor lens, which has been the, the lens which has come out for myopia management, would that be more effective in certain cases? Or if you have any experience on that? So I wish I had experience with it. There are no spectacle lens options approved in the United States. There is the, um, the sight glass lens is coming. There's, I think, myovision, and then there's the DIMS lens. And the DIMS lens, I think, is renamed to the, the uh, similar one. I forget the exact one. But there's several, uh, several spectacle lens options coming. They are split uh, refractive lenses, like there's little slits all the way around the lens to kind of have this like multifocal option. So I, I know of the lenses, but I haven't been able to offer them. If anything goes like the MySight lens, they got that in Canada about three years before the United States. So Canada got the, the, the DIMS lens in July of last year. So hopefully in a year or two, we can have a spectacle lens option. And I think that will dramatically change myopia management in the United States and probably around the world just because more people are comfortable prescribing spectacles. It's not any different prescription than you would for your, your typical patient. You just has to have a different lens put in. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, the next question is also similar related to that. Uh, so we just, uh, you know, you have already answered about spectacle lenses and the availability and all that. And the data is there, like the, 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 or there is good studies backing up the spectacles. So I, it, if you have that option, I would, I would go for it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, 
any any criteria of uh, you know selecting ads or the near power what we say i mean you did mention you want to go somewhere around plus 2 or slightly higher than plus 2 uh any criteria that maybe probably high myops require more plus less myops require less plus or something like that which you which you tend to do in your practice the uh the blink study is the only trial that I know of that's compared different ad powers. So Blink found that 250 works. The, the MySight Lens Plus 2, that works. In the Blink study, 150 did not work, at least was not more than the control. So I try to do at least plus 2. The NatureView is essentially plus 3. So the more you can go, the higher you can go, the better within reason. You can't make your patients blurry and Catherine Bickle one of my friends did a study on ad powers and once you get up to plus 3 some patients have trouble adapting to that so i wouldn't ever go like plus 350 um it just would make it disorienting for the patients that's right yeah and i think the next question is uh, very connecting to what we were saying that you know there was one patient uh, who was wearing my sight lenses and due to the larger pupil size they had the problems in adaptation and you know seeing that halos or probably shadows around the alphabets so what would be your recommendation could they still continue these lenses or you would probably take them out of my sight and choose another uh, lens design or how would you tackle this situation if the patient was unhappy with their vision they're not going to wear it right so I would switch lenses. You could try another design like the NatureView or Biofinity. The Biofinity is going to be similar probably to the MySight. If you're having a lot of trouble, you could go with a custom soft lens and make the optic zone bigger. I did have um uh, at least one IntelliWay patient the custom soft lens where I had to make the optic zone a millimeter bigger cuz he had bigger pupils than the average kid and that that helped. Um you were running that issue with orthokeratology too the treatment zones start small and they start to have glare and halos um kids don't notice it as much as adults but that's an issue and if you need to you can actually make those optic zones bigger too though with the optic zone you don't want it to go too big because then you may avoid the peripheral optics that you need for slowing eye growth so there's a balance all right yeah and if conversely let's let's assume that the patient was comfortable with the vision part of it he, i mean the patient was comfortable in terms of he can read 66 or 20 20 vision but still complains about shadows you know around the letters so will that be something which bothers us as practitioners or would 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 we be doing something else if in this sense the patient says that yeah i'm okay to see 20 20 but i still see that shadows only the quality is affected think, quantity something like that i think that comes down to a, a conversation with your patient and is it bad enough for them to be unhappy you know sometimes there's a little thing that they can deal with but if they can't deal with it you know, that's when you would change it all right okay great and uh, let's look at another couple of more questions uh, would you would you think about giving bifocal uh, lenses instead to patients because of their affordability non compliance and all that uh, you know in terms of myopia management i think you said already that you know start something is better than nothing but any takes on that any add on on that so if you're referring to a progressive edition lens or a flat top bifocal spectacle they don't work you're not going to get a clinical me- clinically meaningful amount based upon the comet study so i would never do a pal in this situation if you have the option of doing like a dims lens you know something specific for myopia management i would go with that but you're just wasting i think in my opinion at least in, from the studies i've read people's money by having them do a, a pal or a flat top bifocal spectacle for myopia management all right okay yeah so that that's uh, very thoughtful i mean we need to know this because uh, people do prescribe different kind of spectacle lenses as well and and as per your clinical experience and according to the comet study as well as you mentioned it's something which may not be beneficial for the patient so maybe we can go in for uh, 
soft multifocal lenses because that would be easily available if not the my sight if not the other uh, ortho k and all that but at least uh, soft multifocal contact lenses would be available in most part of the world can you get atropine uh we we do get but the the problem is some parts here in the asian context we are not authorized to use uh, Uh, okay. you know, so ophthalmologists take care of that portion. If we are working as independent clinicians in working in an optical practice or an optometric clinic as well, we are not authorized uh, to prescribe atropine. So that's a challenge. Yeah, that makes sense. And we didn't get that ability until a few decades ago in the United States. So I can see that being a problem. But in the United States, I kind of use that as my catch-all. If they can't do the other things, I just put them on atropine. <laughs> So maybe you refer your patients in that case. Uh yeah, you can co-manage it. I think that could be good, right? So co-manage it with the uh, ophthalmologist whereby you know the ophthalmologist can prescribe and you can co-manage by monitoring the patient and the patient still stays with you. Right? I agree. Yeah. And one last question I think uh, which we would like to take here. Uh, all of these myopia control lenses have one standard base curves especially in the soft lens perspective and you know since the corneal curvatures and axial length and all that are different uh, would customization be the way to go or how how would you particularly look at that did this bother you in in your clinical practice about the base curves it doesn't bother me there i'm sure will be a patient who i have a lens that doesn't fit eventually but the commercially available lenses are generally made to fit up to like 90% of the population and if your patient doesn't work in that specific base curve you could always do a custom soft lens or you could do um i i've even done a scleral lens in a really complicated patient but there there are options if your your soft lens modalities just don't fit that patient that's right yeah so as you talked about there are various options so if probably one option does not work you can at least look at something else right i mean there is some mm-hmm. something or the else there uh, we just need to know how to go about it so All right. exactly right so uh, thank you so much uh, dr pakka i think we have taken most of the questions which uh, you know popped out on the chat and Uh, thank you for answering those questions and you know sharing your experiences in terms of your myopia management uh, clinic as well. I'm happy to. I see one easy one to answer that we didn't. So, orthokeratology lenses are color coded by eye. So, I use blue and green. So blue is left eye and green is right eye. There's an L in blue and a you know L in left and then an R in green and an R in right. Anyway, but I appreciate your your time in allowing me to speak with you all and for having me back again. Happy to come back again at some point if you have a topic I can help with. Surely, surely, Dr. Pa, we'll get into that. Thank you so much and have a great evening. You too. Thank you everyone. Yeah. We are, we do have session planned uh, next weekend. Thank you so much everyone for attending. Thank you Dr. Pakar once again for staying up late. Uh, I know you have another a uh, session to attend in a couple of hours as well uh, the bcla is going to start within the next 4 uh, to 5 hours so i hope you get some rest and uh, hope to see you around take care everyone be safe and bye bye